Eric Darling here with Darling Data. Uh, surrogate child of Beer Gut Magazine. Long, beautiful relationship. Uh, today I want to talk about isolation levels a little bit uh, because something that keeps coming up and the, the most annoying things about isolation levels keep coming up. Things that I really loathe having to repeat or try to tell people about over and over again. And uh, we're going we're gonna to do that today. Because Friday, there's nothing like a good Friday talk about isolation levels. So first, no isolation level is perfect for everything all the time. Uh, I wish that one was because then we could all just use that and we could stop having these conversations. Uh, but usually, uh, SQL Server world, the things that I have to talk people out of is one, using no lock hints, uh, because that's where you get bad data, potentially, under concurrency. Uh, and the other one is the switch between uh, read committed, the default pessimistic isolation level in SQL Server, and uh, read committed snapshot isolation, which is an optimistic isolation level in SQL Server. Uh, the reason why that's the, the usual choice is because most people have to, like, like don't want to, like, like, you could use snapshot isolation, but then every query would have to ask for snapshot isolation in some way, either like, uh, like, when it, like if, if it's an application, when it connects to SQL Server, if it's a store procedure, you have to add it to the code, stuff like that. And that just, you know, unless you have a lot of control, unless you have a lot of time and patience to figure out which queries you want to use an optimistic isolation level, then... Uh, that's kind of a tougher one to talk folks into. You, that also assumes that you have control over those things, right? Like some, if you have a third-party application, you might not. Your only hope might be to use read-committed snapshot isolation, which kicks in for every read query that comes in and hits the database. So that's the most common choice. The thing is, every time I talk about switching over, uh, someone will go do some due diligence, uh, and then they'll, they'll read some... Uh, blog posts where uh, all they can talk, they, they think that there are bugs in SQL Server with read like race conditions and things like that. And uh, that's really not the case. The case is that there are certain query patterns you have to watch out for where you might hit race conditions. Now, I'm not saying that read committed snapshot isolation is perfect because, again, it's not, but for servers that I look at, where there is a lot of bad blocking between readers and writers and a lot of deadlocking between readers and writers, read committed snapshot isolation is perhaps the safest way to solve all of those problems in one go. You'll still have write queries block one another, but the read queries fighting with write queries and write queries fighting with read queries goes away completely. So it is a great isolation level for most SQL Server workloads, and most mature database platforms out of the box use some form of multi-version multi concurrency control by default, right? Even Azure SQL DB uses it by default because Microsoft probably like, like hey, we're going to release this product, we're going to manage it. Uh, we don't want people complaining about blocking all the time because then they have to go solve blocking problems and that's not fun because that's query tuning, index tuning, stuff like that. So <clears throat> read committed the pessimistic isolation level has a lot of problems that one might consider to be race conditions if one were to be really concerned about application and query concurrency. So here's the first example, and I'm going to figure out which way I have to turn. There we go. That, there's, that should get us in the frame, or get, get all the text in the frame, rather. So if you uh, have a query that just finished reading uh, what used to be row C, but is now a ghost record because it was deleted, and your query just finished reading it and has now moved on to row D, that, that row C will still show up in your query results because your query already grabbed it. It doesn't disappear from the results. All right, and these, these slides are all from my Foundations of SQL Server Performance Tuning uh, class. Uh, I delivered it at Pass. I'm delivering it a couple more times. Uh, Data Tune in Nashville and up in Boston in May, as part for the... New England SQL Server user group. Uh, if you're in either of those areas, it would be a pleasure to see you. The second reason why read committed isn't uh, really all that promising of an isolation level is let's just pretend that again, we just finished reading row C 
but then it gets updated and now we have two row H's. Our query will show one letter C and two H's in the results, right? That's not, that's not great either, right? That would seem like a race condition. That would seem like a bug, but that's the way read committed works. Read committed, read committed the non snapshot pessimistic isolation level. It takes very brief read locks on things, but data can change on either side of those locks whenever it wants. Right? Because those, those locks don't hold on for very long. There's no lock escalation with read queries, uh, at least you know, without hints or whatever. But all of this stuff is open to change as soon as those locks get released. Another reason why uh, it's not great is because similar situation. Uh, let's say we're reading row E. Uh, row F gets updated to be another value C. So now we have two C's over here, but all, all, all our query will see is one C and no F, right? And those are, again, something that could very much be interpreted as a race condition in your queries if you are really concerned about concurrency. Now, this is stuff that read committed snapshot isolation fixes, but we have to talk about some other stuff first. Uh, the first thing we have to talk about are some query patterns in uh, under read committed the pessimistic isolation level, they can also cause things that look like race conditions, but are really just, again, the lack of promise that read committed has as for, far as what data it's going to return. So if you do something like this, right, you, you know, in your store procedure and your query, uh, whatever it is, if you set some variable value equal to something based on a select, Locks on that select, unless you add locking hints and a transaction, don't hold on once that query's done. Actually, even like once it finds that row, like data, data in the table can change all over the place. So if you were to take this, like whatever this gets set to, and use it to like, you know, insert into another row, uh, use it to like find data that you're going to update, that data could be completely irrelevant by the time your query gets to it. Again, under concurrency. If you're just running it in isolation, everything's gonna look great every time, but under concurrency, the data in there could change really quickly. Another pattern that could have similar effects as a race condition, and big air quotes on that, is if you dump data into a temp table and then you use that temp table to go update things because whatever's in that temp table is maybe invalid by the time you go to do that update. So these are things that a lot of folks don't think about when it comes to matters of concurrency. And this is a lot of the lack of understanding about the promises that read committed, the pessimistic isolation level makes are way overblown. A lot of people think that read committed, the pessimistic isolation level behaves like snapshot isolation, like where your query takes a picture of the data and it's perfect, or like serializable where nothing can change while your query's reading the data, right? Because like everyone thinks that like what it's returning is like this magnificent piece of data, but all it really promises is blocking and deadlocking with modification queries and very, very, and all it promises is that the data that it read was committed at the time that the read happened. So remember, just like in the slides, modifications can happen all around it. The only thing that's guaranteed is if you hit a, a lock, your query will wait for that lock to release before reading that. That's the only real guarantee that read committed the pessimistic isolation level makes. Now, the next thing I got to talk about is query patterns that might exhibit what seems like a race condition under an optimistic isolation level. But a lot, of the, a lot of the times when you hit this, these are also things where there is some potential for these as well under a pessimistic isolation level. They're just a little bit more rare. They're actually pretty rare under even an optimistic isolation level because you have to write really dumb queries for stuff like this to happen. So <clears throat> um, I'm in my database crap. At least I hope I am. Home is where the crap is. And uh, I've got this table called dinner plans. And I'm going to populate that table with, uh, well, when I, when I wrote this demo originally, uh, there were a bunch of people who I thought I was going to have dinner with at pass. Uh, turned out the only person I had dinner with was Kendra. Uh, but that was nice anyway. It was a great, great, actually it was like a few dinners with Kendra. She's like the only person who would hang out with me. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> not, not bad company though. 
Uh, and so right now in that table, the, our dinner plans table, this is what things look like. You got a list of people and for some reason seat number one is free, but the other five seats in the table are all taken. So we're going to make sure that our CSI is off for our crap database. And we're going to look at uh, a, the, I have these queries set up in the other two windows over here, but we're going to look at just real quick what the query does. So this is the kind of sort of dumb query pattern that would exhibit a race condition under RCSI that it might not necessarily hit under a pessimistic isolation level, but could still happen if things got weird enough. So what we're doing is updating uh, a table alias, our table dinner plans, which is alias as DP. Uh, if you are um, not a very mature person, you want to make jokes, go ahead. But they're, it's dinner plans, nothing more. So uh, we're updating our dinner plans table. And for, for some reason, rather than just doing a you know, regular update, uh, we're doing this exists check through the base table to look for an ID where the seat is free. So this is where things get interesting because we have two references to the table. We have one for the update and one for the select. Only the reference for the update will ever have the type of exclusive locks on it that will prevent a read query under a pessimistic isolation level from executing and getting data. Right? The reference to this in the select portion, that can read Whatever. So if you have a no lock hint in there, you're screwed. Uh, if you, uh, you know, if in that inner query, you know, we talk, any of the stuff happens that we talked about, uh, that like where data can change around where the reads under the pessimistic read committed isolation level happens, you could still hit what feels like a race condition. All right. So let's go look at what happens <clears throat> when we do this. So I'm going to say begin tran. I'm going to run that. And we've output this. And now I'm going to come over here and I'm going to run this. And this is going to get blocked, right? This, is, this query is now blocked because we have this update in a transaction, updating dinner plans. And this query wants to update dinner plans and read from dinner plans. We come back over to this first window and we commit this. This query will come back and return no results, right? This, because that other query blocked it, updated that row to find uh, a free seat. This query did not find a free seat when it went to run. So let's commit this now so that we don't have anything weird going on. Let's make sure this is fully committed. Now let's change the crap database to turn read committed snapshot isolation on. Right, this takes a second to run. That's OK. It's worth it. OK, so now that's turned on. We're good. If we repeat that same demo, Right, we're going to run this. Oh, you know what? I didn't reset things. Uh, let me commit that. Totally forgot to reset the table between runs so that that didn't fail. <laughs> and uh, the joys of remembering stuff. All right, so now let's run that. And see, this one finds this. Right, and now let's run this. Now, this is still going to get blocked because that update is still happening in the, in the other window, right? This, this transaction is still not committed. But because of the way uh, an optimistic isolation level works, when this query did its update, the last known good version of the row uh, got sent to either, if you're not using accelerated database recovery, it gets sent to tempdb. If you're using accelerated database recovery, it gets sent to the version store, uh, local to the user database you're in. And now, uh, because this query, is going to read a versioned row that from this that this query is updating. When we right this one found this seat right, and we commit this. Now we come over here, and what did we find? We found a seat. And we know we found a seat because this thing got updated to the reverse Eric down here. All right. So now if we commit this, uh, we'll have a little bit of an awkward situation because forward Eric will think that he got a seat at the dinner table, but backwards Eric will have the golden ticket and say, I get to sit there. You don't get to sit there. And then forward Eric and reverse Eric will like matter and antimatter fight and I don't know, some, some sort of universe death probably will happen. So 
these are the kind of query patterns that can cause things that, again, look and feel like race conditions under RCSI that you wouldn't necessarily hit under read committed, the pessimistic isolation level. But uh, again, the promises that read committed, the pessimistic isolation level make are really flimsy. So under most circumstances, uh, for most query workloads where people aren't writing completely idiotic queries, or if you have no lock hints everywhere anyway, you're probably better off using an optimistic isolation level because there's far less like room for error than there is when you're using no lock hints. And there's far less pain than if your read queries are blocking and deadlocking with your write queries all the time. Right? So like this is most queries function better in any database using an optimistic isolation level. If you have queries that don't, if you have queries that need to read the most up-to-date version of data, just keep in mind that those queries are going to be subject to blocking and deadlocking. If you want to enable read committed snapshot isolation and you want to have certain queries not use row versioning, there's a perfectly good read committed lock hint you can add to those queries or other locking hints that would make sense for those queries. Uh, but just like a direct update like this wouldn't have the problems that we were looking at. The problem really is the subquery doing the select reads a version of the row that it, pro that it looks like it wasn't supposed to because that should have been taken. But you know, again, it takes pretty high concurrency for you to find these problems uh, and it takes pretty stupid looking queries for you to find these problems. All right. So, uh, in this case, you know, that self-join, completely unnecessary. Uh, if you write modification queries that do things like that, you kind of deserve what you get. Uh, that's not a smart way to write queries. But there are times when you would have to write a query sort of like that, in other, like, for, like for like a different query pattern. Like in this one, it's particularly stupid because it's just one table that we want to update and there's no reason to do a subquery to touch another table. But if you, there were like a different table where like we had to like update from like, you know, some reservation list or like a guest list or like, you know, like a list of reservations where you could possibly uh, like go, you know, go to different restaurants or whatever. Those are circumstances when having a subquery would be necessary. But I just want to remind everyone that like those subqueries under read committed could also read some weird data, like data could change before or after and because this table is the only one that's not going to have any sort of exclusive locks taken in there or around it, in this, wherever the select is. So if you join tables together to do updates and there's a no lock hint on like one of the, on the table that's not getting updated or you're just using read committed, the pessimistic isolation level, you can still see weird stuff that'll look and feel like race conditions under a pessimistic isolation level um, well, actually, specifically under read committed, the pessimistic isolation level, serializable and repeatable read offer way more guarantees. They also offer way more blocking. <laughs> so um, you have that to look forward to. Anyway, uh, this was a little bit longer than I expected. And like I said, it's Friday and uh, I've got some stuff I got to go do. So I'm going to go do that. I'm going to get this started uploading uh, as usual. Uh, I hope you enjoyed yourselves. I hope you learned something. I hope that if you are not currently using an optimistic isolation level and you have a lot of problems with locking and blocking, that you'll consider using an optimistic isolation level. Uh, I hope that if you are slathering your queries with no lock hints, some bizarre cargo culting about saying that's a best practice, that you'll consider using an optimistic isolation level and removing those. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, Pretty please give it a like uh, if you enjoy uh, this sort of technical SQL Server content. Uh, feel free to subscribe to my channel. Uh, I'm always happy to have new folks coming in learning stuff. Uh, and I don't know, gosh, I think that's it. Can't think of a single other thing to say. Happy Friday. Hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Have a good one.